My dear friends, I write this to you that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the anointing sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly complete with them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm writing to you a new command, but not an old one, with you, <clears throat> which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light hates a brother, <clears throat> but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brothers and sisters lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I am writing you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not live in the world or anything, do not love the world or anything in the world. If you, if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of flesh, the lust of eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. All right, as a reminder, we are going through uh, this summer, we're going through the book of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, the three Johns, hence the J to the third power. And... Uh, as we looked at John last week, we talked about the fact that the Apostle John has written five books of the Bible, um, and as, he, as we go through the book of, of 1 John, one of the things that we know is, is that John was exiled or, um, to Patmos at one point. He had, was sent off, that's where he wrote Revelation, but, but in addition to that, John had to, uh, had to leave Jerusalem. For a little bit of history, the disciples, the apostles, and Jesus, the, their ministry took place mostly in Jerusalem or in, in, in Jewish areas. And yet, um, as time went on, persecution in those, those areas where there was more of the Jews, Jerusalem being a primary one of them, as time went on, their pure persecution of Jewish Christians increased. And as that persecution increased, it forced the Christians to leave from there, which wasn't God going, oh shoot, I didn't see this happening. God used it as an opportunity to bring the gospel to the world. And one of those bringing the gospel outside of Jerusalem to the non-Jews and to the Gentiles was the Apostle John. It's likely that he was actually writing this from the, the city of Ephesus. And uh, he was writing to address false teachers and, and Gnosticism. I asked a question last week, how many of you could spell Gnosticism? Bill proved to me afterwards that he can spell Gnosticism. So if you're struggling, go see Bill. He can actually tell you how to spell it if you want it for your notes. Um, but the false teaching in this Gnosticism was teaching a, a, a twist on the gospel. They weren't saying that Jesus wasn't a real person, but they were twisting the gospel and saying things like, Jesus may not have been God, actually. Maybe he was just a good person. Or, or, or maybe Jesus was a, a lesser God. Or, or, or maybe Jesus was God for a little bit, but not the whole time. And, and they were, were twisting the truth. And John is writing to say, hey, I'm here to set the record straight. 
And I should probably pause there. As Christians, we need to be careful because these were Jewish, uh, these were Gentile Christians who at one point had followed Jesus, who knew the gospel, but they allowed teaching that sounded pretty good to pull them away from what was truth. They started to embrace things that, that seemed okay. I mean, it maybe made them feel good because, well, Jesus, um, he was still a good guy. And, and, and so, so, okay, it's, it's still all right. And, and we in, in the church here in the U.S. and probably in the world can be tempted to start to say, well, you know, yeah, the Bible's good and I, we believe it, but if somebody wants to believe something else, that's okay too. In fact, it's, all, it's, it's probably all one big happy family and we're all going to end up at the same place anyway. If we're not careful, we will find ourselves straying from truth. And that's what's happened here. The church has started to stray from what was true. And John says, hey, I'm here to set the record straight. And I'm setting the record straight not just because of who I am. This isn't about me, John. But I'm setting the record straight because I actually was with Jesus. I spent years with him, being trained by him. And it's not just based on my word. It's based on that of other apostles and what they've seen and what they've witnessed. And I'm here to tell you, you're drifting away and we need to refocus and you need to realize that he is the one true God. And here's what that means for your life. And last week, as we went through the, the first chapter of John, we talked about how, how God's desire for us is that we would experience a, a full life, that full spiritual life, that Zoe life. And that at the time of, of salvation, at that time when we put our faith in Jesus, we are given new life in Christ. That, that old is past, the new is gone. It doesn't mean that we don't still battle some of the old stuff because there's also, we talked about, there's also the mind. There's also the flesh, your, your, your humanity. But you have God in you if you are a follower of Jesus. And so as we, we move into this week, we're going to be talking about what it looks like to live the Christian life. And that life to the fullest isn't meant to be a boring, mundane life. But as we start, and I, I want to ask, how many of you have any experience with augmented reality or virtual reality? Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, we've got, we got a handful of you. So augmented virtual reality, and, and you can put that slide up, Sue. Um, these are a couple of the devices that are out there or coming out for augmented and virtual reality. And it's the idea that, that you, can, you can put something on that will alter your reality or your view of reality or let you experience a reality different from the one that you're truly in. And, and there's different manufacturers coming out with them. PlayStation has theirs. Uh, Meta or Facebook has theirs. Apple just announced that they're jumping in on it as well. Microsoft, I believe, has one, um, as do others. But the, the reality is you put this on to be able to uh, do different things. One, you get to be in the middle of a game, so it's like you're in the game and not just watching a game. Another is, uh, I've heard people talking about the Apple one, that they're excited about being able to sit down someplace and do work where it looks like you're sitting on a mountaintop or sitting at the beach when you're actually in your office. Um, the, there's another virtual reality thing that, that people are attracted to is connection with other people and looking like we're actually together when actually we are not. But it's this idea that, that we, we aren't together or we aren't experiencing it physically, but our minds, we can. All right, well, here's one that probably more of you have experienced. How many of you have used, used, used YouTube? If your hand's not up, you're probably lying to me. Uh, okay, so uh, get some discussion going. What is your favorite thing to watch on YouTube? What do you use YouTube for? How to's, Tobias. Football highlights. Football highlights. Music. How to put oil to lift up your engine on your, yes, yes, mechanical stuff. Somebody else had their hand up, I thought. No? Watch people do dumb things and laugh at them. Yes, 
Eve's would be to laugh, watch people get scared and laugh hysterically at them getting scared. Or watch what? The funny, the funny cat videos. Yes. Yes. Watching funny cat videos. Now, I, uh, I enjoy watching, I don't watch a whole lot of YouTube, um, but when I do, I like to watch two things. Usually it's the, the people that are building something in the wild, like they're building their cabin out in the middle of nowhere. It's like, how did you get there? I'm, I'm convinced 99% of them are fake. Like on the other side, you'll see a road if you could. But, but yeah, they're out in the middle of nowhere. The other one is the van life people or the camper life people. Uh, the people that are, have converted their schoolies and they're driving across the com- country living out of this camper. and all. I just think that is so cool. But as we look at these things for food, for traveling, for learning how to do stuff, often the reason we do it is similar reasons to why we use a virtual reality. It's so that we can experience something that we, we haven't already done ourselves. We're living vicariously through somebody else. Maybe it's because they have an ability we don't. Maybe it's because we think they have the money we don't. Maybe it's because they have debt that we don't. I don't know what the situation is. Maybe they have the courage that we don't. We're more comfortable sitting at our couch or in our bed um, than we are going out and actually living life. But I want to challenge you today that the Christian life, your life as a follower of Jesus, should be a one of adventure. And I can base that here on, on 1 John chapter 2. I want to jump first to, to verses 5 and 6. And this is what, what John says. He says, This is how we know that we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. So what does it look like to live as Jesus did? Now there's a whole lot of things that we could cover. As you'll look at your note sheet, you'll see that I didn't cover everything. Um, You don't know what I covered because I left blanks. But but there is only a few things that we're going to hit on today that's just a, a, a look at some of the key ones. The first one is that we need to love like Jesus. We need to love like Jesus. So let me ask, what does it look like to love like Jesus? Kirti. Love unconditionally. Who else? What's it look like to love like Jesus? Authentic. Okay. Patient. Ooh, that's good. Hard, but good. Yeah, it's about that person and not that the sins that they've committed or are committing for real. Did you have another thought? Nope. nope. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to... If you could see in my head, you'd see the wheels going of, what do I say? Do I say? No, I'm not going to say it. So, um, J- John references in... Second John, he references an old command. And that old command is a look back to Leviticus 19.18. And that in Leviticus 19.18, we're told, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is God Himself. He, this is the old command He's given. He's saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, an interesting point here that I'm not going to belabor too much, but, but don't miss the part that it says, as you love yourself. Because you have to love yourself. And that's not a pride thing. That's a taking care of yourself thing. That's a you need to get rest. That's a you need to uh, be willing to forgive yourself for the mistakes that you've made. Sometimes you're, it's easy to forgive somebody else, but not yourself. And you're holding on to something that you've held on to for years. Maybe it's, it's loving yourself and realizing, hey, I am good enough. Not because of who I am, but because of who God is. And, and, and if we look at Scripture, we see in Genesis 1.27 that, that man, humans, us, we were created in God's image. So, so if you aren't enough, if, if, if you look at you and you go, yeah, but I, I'm not worth anything, you're saying to God, what you made is not right. You screwed up with me. And I promise you that He didn't. We, we can look through, through Scripture and we can see that He knew us before we were born. There's even references to w- with Samuel, when Samuel was born, not me Samuel, but Old Testament Samuel, where it talks about the fact that, that God Himself orchestrated the conception of Samuel. 
What that tells me is God was behind each and every one of you. He was there from the beginning, and He truly did create you on purpose and with a purpose. So you have value. So if you're at the point where you're saying, yeah, I could love other people, but I can't love yourself, I want to pause you there and say, we're told to love ourselves. But John also says Jesus did what he often does, and he took that command and he one-upped it. He made, he made a new command. And that new command is found in John 13, 34. And now we have God as Jesus, Jesus as God, saying, a new command I give you. That's the hint that it's the new command. Uh, a new command I give you. Love one another. But not just, not just as you love yourself. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. He's saying, I am setting the bar. Look at me. Love like I love. So what does that look like? That looks like a bold love. That looks like a bold love that loves people who, who others may say are unlovable. That looks like a, a, a bold love that says, I'm going to be available to people. That looks like a, a bold love that says, I'm going to sit down and have meals with people who aren't like me. Remember the criticism that Jesus got even for just eating meals? He got criticism for eating meals with, with tax collectors on multiple occasions. One time with, he sits down with Zacchaeus and they're like, oh, look, what's going on here? And notice that Zacchaeus realized that God saw him. Another one is a guy named Levi. You may know him as Matthew. And the, 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 the community, the crowd started murmuring. He's like, oh, he's with tax collectors and sinners. Look at this guy. If you look in your Bible, there's a book called Matthew. Because there's a guy named Matthew who wrote a book. That, Jesus was, really, was willing to love people who others said he should not even associate with. He was available. I want to encourage you that loving people means taking risks. It means taking risks. I, I heard, you probably heard me mention Bob Goff's name. I, I, I'll just say Bob Goff. He's a, he's a writer. He's a lawyer. He's a uh, representative for the nation of Uganda to the U.S. Uh, he does a lot of things. But anyway, Bob Goff, um, one of the things he does, he said, to, to give himself permission each year to love boldly. One of the things he talks about doing is that he gives himself two tickets. And I don't even know if they use these tickets anymore, but you know the, the paper tickets like you used to get at carnivals? Like you'd, you'd get the, the, they tear off one, you'd get one, they'd keep one. Okay, well, he'd give himself two of those tickets at the start of each year. And those tickets were tickets that were permission for him to, allow, to make really big mistakes in a year. And he's saying, you know what? I am going to give myself permission to really screw up twice. You know why that's important? Because if we are so concerned about not screwing up, we will live safe, protected lives. We won't take chances. And that, what that means, you will not step out in faith. Because faith is a risk. Faith is me saying, God is going to do something that I can't do. Faith is me saying, I'm going to schedule a community outreach event when I don't have the funds to do it, but I believe God's calling me to do it, and God provides. Faith is when you say, hey, I'm going to take a group of people to WLS, and I don't know how it's all going to come together, where they're flying from, where they're driving from, if they're going to make the bus, how it's all going to come together, how we're going to fund it, but it's all going to happen. Faith is saying, I really believe God's called us to, to do a prayer tent. I don't even know what a prayer tent looks like other than God's called us to do it. And I don't even know who's going to do it, but, but yes, that's faith. Faith is stepping out into your job and loving people when they're unlovable. Faith is, is going to work and living your convictions even though no one else does. So give yourself permission to screw up. And when you screw up, rip up that ticket, set it aside, and go, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep moving ahead because I will make more mistakes. Little side note, if you've torn up both of your tickets by the end of the first week of January, you're probably taking reckless risks <laughs> instead of faced risks. Risk could look like stepping into adoption. Risk could look like 
uh, bringing people into your home in foster care. Risk could look like any other number of things. My challenge to you is look at the life of Jesus and when he loved boldly, he took risks. You don't believe that's true? One thing that most people will agree on, whether they agree on what happened afterwards or why, is that Jesus died on a cross. You want to talk about, humanly speaking, what would it be a risk? He gave up his life for us. And he did it so that anyone who believed could have a relationship with him, full well knowing that the majority of people would not follow, would not accept it, would not believe, yet he still did it. That's what it looks like to love like Jesus. And when you love like Jesus, you'll find it leads to the next one, which is serving like Jesus. You'll see that, that it's not about me, it's about what can I do for other people? How can I help other people? How can I support the church? How, and by church, I mean the body of Christ. How can I share the gospel with other people? What can I do? Philippians 2, 6-8 through says, Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He wasn't afraid to give up absolutely everything for the good of you, for the good of me. We see other examples. We see him washing the disciples' feet, which was like the most menial of tasks. In fact, it was so menial that the other apostles that were there, they didn't do it. Because if you read the, the, the passage, you'll notice that it doesn't say that Jesus had to go find somebody with a rag or that he had to go find somebody that had the water so that he could do it. The assumption is that would have already been in the room. And there was an opportunity for the other 12 of them to serve. None of them did. It was Jesus who served. You see Him healing sick. You see Him healing the hurting. You see Him making time for people. You know what you don't see? And correct, I'm willing to be corrected if anybody can. But to my knowledge, you never see Jesus running around like a chicken with his head cut off. You never see him in a hurry to get somewhere. You never see him living a chaotic life. In fact, I can't find a passage where you see him running. He walked everywhere. When one of his closest friends died, he took four days to get there. Some of us need to, and I'm preaching it myself as much with this, some of us need to slow down. We need to stop hurrying quite as much and make time to love and serve other people. We're missing out on the adventure because we're so busy keeping busy. And when we love like Jesus, and when we serve like Jesus, what we'll see is we end up glorifying God like Jesus. Because it's never about us. We don't do any of this so we get the praise. We don't invite people to come over for dinner that, that may not have any family or friends because we want people to look at us. We don't say, hey, we're going to uh, go on a mission trip to a different area or we're going to bring people to WLS or we're going we're gonna to serve our neighbor because it's about us. We do it because of God. Jesus said it this way, and so I'll just use his words. John 17, 4. He says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. For Jesus, it wasn't all about him getting the praise. He took and deflected it to God the Father and said, it's all about him. It always has been, it always will be about Him. And when you 
and I give God the glory, when you and I give God the credit, we're pointing people back to him. I'll give you an example. A weird thing's happened over the last couple of weeks um, in that a number of people have approached me with comments about, you have done a great job as a father. You do a great job with your kids. And let me just say, I, I answer it with a couple things. First is, I am fortunate I have some amazing kids. I truly do. I am thankful for them. I am blessed to be a father. But I follow that up with something. And I'll, I'm going to give you a little backstory. I remember when Miriam was born, and I, I've shared this maybe before. Miriam, my oldest, when she was born, um, I'll take a step back even before that. One of us in the relationship was really excited about having kids. One of us wasn't. Eve was the one that was really excited. I'll let you figure out which one I was. And so I'm leaving the hospital, and I've just seen this baby, this new life. And I'm driving home to let out the dogs and so Eve can rest. And, and my brain is just going because I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what did I just do? We brought a human being into a fallen world with all sorts of issues and all sorts of problems. What were we thinking? And sometime in that moment, there was a reminder, probably God Himself, probably the Holy Spirit saying, Sam, the world needs people now, and they will need people in the future who love Jesus, who can proclaim the gospel, and who can love other people. And then the other thing that he said really loud, probably, was it's not all about you. And in that, what, what even I have been intentional about doing, especially in the early years, was as we would spend time in prayer with our family, we would pray and ask for God's help raising our kids. We would say, God, help us raise our kids to be the people you desire them to be. And, and then we'd follow that up with, and God, where we screw up, and we will, we need you to fill in the gaps. So what happens now is when someone says, Sam, you've done an amazing job raising your kids, I respond with, I am blessed. I have some amazing kids, but I am here to tell you I don't have it all figured out and that God gets the credit because I'm sure I screwed things up along the way and my prayer from the start has been that God would fill in where I screw up. Again, I don't say that to say, hey, look at Sam, because I can point to me and say, hey, I can show you other times when I haven't done such a great job. But my point is, you will have opportunities to point people to God for what happens through you and to give Him all of the glory. For Jesus, it wasn't all about giving, getting Him the praise for Himself. For us, it shouldn't be either. Our loving and serving should point people to Jesus. And for some of you, that might mean missions work. For some of you, that might mean going overseas and doing missions. For some of you, that might mean bringing people into your home who are not your biological family. For some of you, that might be being involved in camps in your backyard. For some of you, that might mean serving at the breadbasket. For some of you, that might be living out a God-centered, Christ-focused life in your workplace. Because in your workplace, providing you're not a solopreneur, in your workplace, you are going to be surrounded by people who do not know Jesus. And even if you are a solopreneur, you better have some other people or you're going out of business real fast. And so as you're coming into contact with those people, you are going to get a chance to live a God-centered, Christ-focused life, to love them like Jesus did, and in doing so, point them to the Father. In all of this, if your life is boring, you are doing it wrong. If your life is uneventful, you are doing it wrong. Because I look at Jesus' life, and as slow as He took it, and as low-paced as He had it, He did not have a boring life. He interacted with people. Now maybe we need to redefine what boring is. Maybe that's the spot. But the reality is, your life is meant to be an adventure. 
And you and I only have so many years until we are in heaven with the Father, assuming we know Jesus. If not, then there's a different outcome. But we only have so many years here. We need to be making the most of it. We need to be living that life to the fullest. We need to take those risks and step out in faith, believing that God who says He is faithful, the God who was faithful in the past, the God who was faithful for the Israelites, the God who was faithful in your life in the past, that He will be faithful in the present and He will be faithful in the future. He has called us to live life to the fullest. Living for Jesus should not be boring. If it is, you might be living too safe. If it is, you might not be loving like Jesus. And if it is, you might not be serving like Jesus. So, as we wrap up, as we wrap up, I want to ask a question for you guys to actually answer. How many of you have had a bad boss? Okay, if you've been in the workforce very long, okay, wait, wait, Mike, we're going to exclude, we're going to exclude your current boss. Oh, okay. I, 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 just, I just realized we might start a family fight over here. Mike, Mike works for his daughter. <clears throat> um, okay. Excluding that situation, um, I'm gone for a week, so if you need counseling, you're going to have to see somebody else. Um, oh, Jamie, oh, Jamie. We'll put you in touch with Jamie. That, that's what we'll do. Anyway, um, Backtrack. Uh, so, sorry, squirrel. A squirrel, yep. Um, my question was, have you had a bad boss? Okay, so what are some, some things that make a bad boss a bad boss? Poor management skills. Poor management skills. Yelling at people, Yelling at people yes. Contradictory instructions. Not taking accountability. They don't take responsibility. Selfishness. They don't, give you pay. they don't give you correct pay. Yes, that can be as well. <laughs> For sure. One of the things that I see in a, a bad boss, and it's kind of been alluded to by some of the comments, is that they point out the negative. They always harp on the flaws. They never give you credit for where credit is due. They don't build you up. They don't call out the best in you. John's not like that bad boss. As we read, we, as we read through, we see John, he's addressing people that have been drifting from their faith. He's addressing people who may not be following teaching fully grounded in truth. He's addressing people who he may have been part of seeing them come to a relationship with Jesus and they've wandered away from that. He's addressing all of that. But as he does, he does a couple things. One, he advocates to God for them. He goes to God on their behalf. And he talks about, I'm sorry, not him, but John talks about Jesus going to God for them, not as a bad boss. He talks about Jesus atoning for them. Atoning for them um, is the, the, the word propitiation might be in some of your Bibles. It's a fun word to say, but I'm guessing you probably don't know what it means. Um, now, that's not a knock on you. It's just not in common English vernacular. But it's talking about um, uh, uh, something that appeases God on your behalf, that takes your place. And he says that, that God did that in the form of Jesus. What John does, though, in all of this, as he points that out, as he points out that, that Jesus covered sin, what John also does is he calls out the best in them. So he says, hey, in the middle of all your screw-ups and everything, I want to remind you this, that God is for you, that, God, that Jesus has already atoned for you, and that when you've already screwed up, He's covered your sin. That's one of John's reactions. The second is, he calls out the best in them, and he says these things in that passage. He says, your sins are forgiven. He says, you know God. He says, you are strong and God lives in you. You have victory over sin and darkness. And Christian, that is true for you as well. Regardless of how hard 
at how bad you've screwed up, this is still true for you. Your sins are forgiven. You know God. You are strong and God lives in you. You have victory over sin and darkness. And if that is true, you can live boldly in the confidence that God, the, guy who, the God who created everything, the God who holds everything in place, that God, the God who created you and put you here, He is for you. So we can live boldly and not in fear in that truth. But, if there is anyone here who has never come to that point where they've acknowledged, I am a sinner. Sinner just means that I, I do things that don't make God happy. Things that go a contrary to His perfect law. And he said, and for those who haven't realized that they are a sinner and said, God, I'm accepting your gift of forgiveness that's made possible through Jesus on the cross. For those of you that, that can't say that you've done those things, you don't have victory over sin. You don't have that ability to live boldly for Jesus because you don't have His power at work in you. In fact, you're headed for an eternity separated from God. And, and the thing about his, your eternity is it starts now when you're living separated from God. You do not have that hope that Miles talked about beforehand that says there's a reason to live. And if you do not have that relationship with God that comes only through Jesus, your adventure is completely meaningless. Life truly is meaningless. So as we close in prayer... I want to ask two questions. First one is, do you need to accept that forgiveness that Jesus offers and begin a relationship with God? And the second, do you need to stop living safe? If you are a Christian, do you need to stop living a safe life and live a bold life for Him, knowing that He is in control and that He is worthy of your trust? Let's pray. Our gracious God, what an honor it is for us to worship You. We are so blessed to have the God, the Creator of all things, love us so much that You sent Your Son Jesus as God to live a life that models what it looks like to live for You. And then to follow up that perfect life with a death on the cross. And in that death, taking on Himself my sins, the ones I've already committed, the ones I will commit, and the ones I might even currently be committing. All of them on that cross. And that goes true for anybody who would acknowledge that they are a sinner and want and need Your forgiveness. So gracious God, we put our hope and faith in You. Help us to live boldly. God, the person that is, is hearing this that's going, man, I'm just living a safe life. God, I pray that You would challenge them, that You would encourage them to get out of the comfort zone and to live boldly for You. Not so that they can have a better life for them, but so that You can be glorified, so that people can see You through their lives, and so that lives can be changed. Not because of them, but because of You. And we give You the praise and the glory for what You've done and what You will do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you in your faith journey. To hear our messages live, head to one of our physical campuses. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com or email us at office at therescuechurch.com.